Okay, so let's do a practical approach for bone tumors. This is the WHO classification of uh, soft uh, of bone tumors. So we have uh, a lot of tumors, right, in the bone. Uh, you may classify them according to the, the, the tissue in the tumor. If the tumor produces cartilage, uh, you may have uh, osteochondromas or chondromas, or chondroblastomas. Uh, the osteogenic tumors are osteoblastoma, osteoblastoma, uh, osteosarcoma, and this classification is, uh, you know, too, too long and too dense. So let's do a practical approach. Uh, and for a practical approach, the best modality is plain film. So plain film is, if you want to give a difference in diagnosis, Rayra is the best uh, way to go. I don't have here the... Yeah, the pointer and the thing to. I think that big. This big thing up here is a pointer. Yeah. All right. So. Is the best modality to characterize to characterize both uh, CT and MRI may help you in some situations or for stratification or for to evaluate the soft tissue component. So location is very important. Uh, the tumors uh, in the epiphysis in the lung box are giant cell tumors. Uh, Infection may simulate a tumor when you see a lipid lesion. Geo may also simulate a tumor. As you see, most of the tumors are in the metaphysis, like osteochondromas, osteosarc, unicameral bone cyst, aneurysmal bone cyst, and chondromas. NOF, uh, Ewing could be in the diaphysis or diametaphysis. And then you have the lesions in the diaphysis. And in the diathesis, you may have metastasis, uh, multiple myeloma, lymphoma, or uh, fibrous dissipation. Osteoosteoma is also in the diathesis. So first of all, you have to think about the location of the tumor. So is a tumor in the epiphysis, in the metathesis, or in the diathesis? And then you start uh, narrowing your differential diagnosis. Age is also very important. So if, it, if you have a patient that is in the first decade and the lesion looks benign, could be a simple bone cyst or EG. If the lesion uh, is aggressive, could be human sarcoma, could be leukemia, or could be metastatic neuroblastoma. All right? If you have a patient under five years old, what is first in your differential diagnosis here? And the lesion is aggressive, under five. Neuroblastoma, yeah. Metastatic neuroblastoma. In the second decade, the this is uh, in, uh, in, at this at this age you have a lot of lesions. The benign lesions are NOF, non or non fibroma or fibrosantoma are synonymous. Um, fibrous dysplasia, unicameral bone cyst, ABC. Osteochondroma, osteochondroma, most of the tumors are in this, in this age. The malignant tumors uh, in this age are osteosarc, uh, Ewing, uh, and adamantino uh, well, adamantinoma is a very uncommon tumor. In the third decade, uh, you have <coughs> enchondromas and giant cell tumors, as benign tumors, and then chondrosarc. And after 40, you have most of the tumors are malignant. You have metastasis first, multiple myeloma, leukemia, chondrosarc, and 
osteosarc secondary to uh, secondary osteosarc as we will see later. Okay, so the first thing that you have to do is you have to decide if the lesion is aggressive or not to narrow your differential diagnosis. Sometimes it's going to be difficult to, do, to say if the lesion is aggressive or not. Aggressive is not synonymous of malignant, right? Because sometimes infection or it may simulate uh, aggressive lesions. So we have to uh, characterize the lesion regarding the presence of cortical destruction. Orientation is not very useful. The sort of transition, this is very useful, and the periodic reaction is also useful. So, of course, if you have cortical destruction, as you see in this case, the lesion is aggressive, right? Uh, you may have also uh, expansion of the cortex, and this could be seen in benign lesions or malignant lesions. For example, metastasis of uh, renal cell carcinoma or thyroid metastasis may expand the bone uh, with thinning of the cortex and with cortical destruction of the okay? But if you see cortical destruction of course the lesion is uh, aggressive. Uh, sometimes, like in this case, this is a... What is this? So NOF is a uh, um, NOF or fibrous cortical defect or fibrous symptoma are uh, the same lesion. Uh, fibrous cortical defect is when it is uh, less than two centimeters. Some people use three centimeters. And in these cases, what you have is a cortical defect. And in this cortical defect, uh, in, is replaced by fibrous tissue. So you may see cortical discontinuity, and that's, this does not mean that the lesion is, is aggressive, right? Uh, so here is clear, you have an NOB lesion with sclerotic margins, so this is an NOF. But when you uh, evaluate the CT, you may think that this is an aggressive lesion because there is cortical discontinuity. Orientation is not really useful, son of transition. Okay, so. If you can go and mark the margins of the lesion with a pen, that means that this is a narrow zone of transition, right? And if the, the lesion has a very well delimited margin, it's usually benign. Give me two exceptions to this rule. <coughs> Aggressive lesions with well-defined margins. Metastasis. Metastasis, you said metastasis? Mm -hmm. Yes, very good. And what, what else? Well, but I, I'm, see, I'm saying uh, aggressive lesion that may look benign, with narrow zone of transition. One is metastasis, and the other one is? Myeloma, mm -hmm. correct. Multiple myeloma. Very good. So if you have this, this is a classification of uh, of lesions with narrow zone of transition that they call, they call this lesion like type 1, right? Type, uh, type 1A, it has a sclerotic margin. Type uh, B, uh, well-defined margin, uh, not non sclerotic And type 1C uh, is kind of ill-defined margin. But the, the, lesion, the lesion is geographic, right? So, what are the possibilities of being malignant if this lesion has an sclerotic margin? So geographic 1A. Very good. Very good. Zero. Okay? <laughs> so if you have a type 1A lesion, that means a lucid lesion with sclerotic margin, and this is not the case, right? This is more like a 1B, I would say. 1B. Usually 1Bs are benign, okay, but they could be malignant. What, what do you mean by, by 1B? 1 is a, you, you may classify the lithium lesions in 1, 2, and 3. Type 1, type 2, and type 3. Type 1 is a geographic lesion. Type 1 with 1A with sclerotic margin. Type B well defined. 
and with no geographic margin, and type 1C ill defined. Geographic but ill defined, right? Then you have type 2 is more freedom, okay? Yeah, so you have a uh, on a normal background, you have multiple indications with different uh, size and different shape. Like, like this case. Uh, this case is maybe more uh, permanent. That is the type three. Okay, so these are the type one, two, and three. So in the type three, you have a loosened, multiple loosened lesions, but uh, ill defined. Can you go there and, and tell me where the lesion ends? It's possible. You cannot go and mark the Basically, I say, well, these tumors reach this, reach this area. Very good. Doctor, yes. what was the diagnosis on those two cases? This, uh, this was a, a chondroblastoma, a chondroblastoma, and this one I don't remember, but I don't know. Could it be a myeloma? This? No, the first one. This one could be. But I'm in the group that the I uh, it looks, yeah, but this could be also infection, could be lymphoma, could be... Usually uh, myeloma is more uh, lytic, you know, more well defined, but could be. I don't, I don't, know, I don't remember the... the, the Periosal reaction, this is also very important. It's not as important as the margins of the leash, but it's also important. So, uh, periodical reaction is uh, non-specific uh, change in the periodium uh, after the irritation of the periodium. So, if you have trauma, you will have some periodical reaction. You may have periodical reaction. If you have infection, you may have periodical reaction. Okay? If you have a fracture, you have periodical reaction, and we call it uh, a cancer, right? Uh, Benign periodical reaction or aggressive is uh, related with time. So if the lesion is a slow process, uh, the periodical bone uh, will uh, the bone will deposit calcium in the periodium and you will see a solid part. And if there is no time and the lesion is very aggressive, if there is no time for uh, the position of calcium, you will see other parts. Okay? Very good. So you have to try to, to differentiate between a thick benign periodical reaction from the aggressive part. So uh, I want you to tell me the spectrum of periodical reactions, okay? From the benign to the most aggressive. What's that? Legal students? Go ahead. Laminar. Okay, so let's start. Do you want to start from the benign side or from the malign from the malignant side? Benign. Okay, yeah. so the laminar, laminar. It's not the it's not the most benign one. Uh, beginning. Yes, yeah, solid, right? Or yes, or uh, monolaminar or solid. Okay, very good. Then you have laminar. yes, multilaminar or onion skin, right? Then. Some burst or hairs uh, on end, and then common triangle. Common triangle. Very good. Excellent. Who said that? My medical student. Very good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so be careful because many benign lesions may produce aggressive periostitis. E.g., is an example uh, of of that. But usually, usually. Malignant lesions will not uh, will not uh, cause uh, benign periostitis. Okay, usually sometimes also may produce some cortical thickening and you may confuse with benign periostitis. But this is a good one. Okay, malignant lesions will not cause benign periostitis reaction. Okay, so what cause is this? So right. So you have thickening of the core. This is a slow growing process. The periodic has a lot of time to uh, deposit calcium. Very good. So this is an example of benign periodic reaction. This is an osteodoxioma. In the osteodoxioma, you have cortical thickening, 
and you have a lucent area that is called the niles. Okay? And here you can see the niles and cortical thing. So give me your differential diagnosis for this lesion, for this osteoarthritis. That's very good. We have cortical analysis. That's a very good. For the. Uh, you know, uh, 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 Osteoblastoma? Mm -hmm. Osteoblastoma, but what's the differential? Blastoma. Osteoblastoma uh, could be, usually in the analysis, is darker. Stress fracture. Stress fracture is a good differential diagnosis. Osteosar, usually is more aggressive, right? Very good. So be careful because sometimes the nidus is in the, uh, it's outside the, this cortical thickening, okay? So you may have the nidus here and all the reaction there, okay? And what happens if you have the nidus in the, uh, in an epiphysis? Will you have periodical reaction? Will you have periodical reaction? No, why? Very good. There is no periodicals. Correct. So if you have a osteoblastoma in an epiphysis or apophysis, you will not have a periodical reaction. You will have a lot of edema, inflammation, swelling, joint diffusion, but not periodical reaction. So osteoblastoma is a tumor uh, that uh, occurs in young people, 80% okay? younger than 25 years old. The common places are tumor arteria, usually in the diaphysis or uh, metaphysis. In the spine, is located in the posterior arch. And this is the differential diagnosis. We say that stress fracture, we say osteomyelitis, meds, osteoblastoma. Uh, uh, Dr. Charles said. Patients to with aspirin, but I don't remember that. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good, uh, a good uh, thing. Aspirin. Part. All right. So uh, you may treat these tumors with, uh, uh, inter with interventional radiology, you may treat this. Uh, you can uh, go there and try to resect the nails with a needle. You can try to remove it. I did it several times, and it's, to penetrate here is almost impossible. Uh, most or, or many of these issues will disappear by the time. So if you treat the pain, uh, will disappear. And then you can also do radio frequency, okay? So I think the important question was how do you treat this first uh, uh, with painkillers and then with uh, radio frequency. All right. So then the next periosteal reaction is the multilaminar or onion skin periosteal reaction. So here the process is a little bit uh, or is more aggressive. So you have some deposition of calcium in the periosteum with this multilaminar uh, appearance. This is a multilaminar appearance in a very aggressive tumor with areas of sclerosis and lytic areas. And also you have an interrupted pattern here, all right? So this is a very aggressive periodic reaction point. Then you have some burst or hair on air periodic reaction. So the periodium attaches to the bone through a sharpest uh, fibers, right? So when this, uh, the process is more aggressive, the calcium deposition is there, at the attachment site in this uh, sharp fibers. And you will have this uh, appearance, all right? And this is a case of osteosar with uh, some worse appearance because of the stretching and calcification of the uh, sharpest fibers. And you also see the sclerotic lesion. Uh, look at this cortical thickening and also loosened areas. Okay. Laminated. Uh, Patterns is also malignant or aggressive. Yes, yes. The Ewing sarcoma, the prototype, right? Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Any of those may have any, you know, this. 
U usually does not form ball, so uh, you, it's, it's, uh, you will not see a posture matrix around the, the lesion, okay? You will see more laminated, more, more than here on it. But you, will, you may have, in any resolution, you may have this, this pattern. So when I was in residency, my professor, one of my professors uh, told me, posture start, start, starts in the lab. So whenever you have this, that means that you have uh, lung, lung metastasis. Okay. So the most aggressive pattern is common triangle or common angle would be a better uh, definition, right? And you have you have elevation of the periosteum, but uh, you may have only the the deposit of calcium in the more superficial pores. So you have this. Uh, angle uh, raising from the from the period. Okay? And this is an other case of Ochozar when you see here where you see here the uh, Coleman triangles, okay? With extensive soft tissue So let's talk about a little bit about Ochozar. It's a tumor of the young people. It's not necessary to know exactly the age, but you have to classify the tumors in tumors of young or open vices and tumors of closed vices, okay, or old people. So osteosar is uh, common in the second decade, is common in the distal femur and uh, proximal tibia, uh, is also common in the proximal tibia, and it's usually in the metaphysis, okay. So osteosar is a tumor of long bones. And it's probably related with the aerobic process of the of the of the <coughs> pressure, right? And in fact, as I told you several times, uh, big dogs have more of the sarc than small dogs. Okay? So the bones the bones uh, uh, grow, grow more, and they have more possibilities of car or have having of the sarco. So usually the mission is. Uh, sclerotic with elytic uh, areas. And you will see uh, osteoid matrix uh, associated with these two. So the matrix is another very important thing that you have to recognize uh, in order to make the diagnosis of a bone tumor. So my question is, can you differentiate benign, matrix, benign osteoid matrix from a linear osteoid matrix. And the second question is, can you differentiate benign chondroid matrix from a lignant chondroid matrix? Not chondroid, no, it's very, very good. Chondroid, benign, and malignant are similar, but osteoid, Okay. Okay. If you maybe the density must be ivory like the correct. Like that, that's the if you see a cloudy looking image, you know, dense like ivory, you know, or like a cloud, uh, that is malignant osteoid matrix. And if you see well differentiated bone, like like the bone, like a long bone or whatever that we can see in osteoid. Uh, Osteoblastoma, that's benign matrix. Okay? So you can be differentiation with, uh, with osteomatrix but not with cosmic matrix. So this is a, look, look at this aggressive cloud like uh, osteomatrix. Right? This is an aggressive tumor, and you have also the loose and sclerotic lesions in the digital bone. Okay? So it's, uh, these are amorphous things. And this is an uh, osteoblastoma. See, this is very similar to bone. Look at the, the transfer process. This is well organized bone. Okay, so this is mature osteoid matrix. And this is a chondroid matrix in an echodroma. And you see uh, arcs and rings, right? This is the typical de description. 
value. So Oxford could be secondary to partial disease, could be secondary to even to more being part, to chronic osteophysis pressure, many things, radiation may produce secondary osteosar. So 90% of the osteosars are conventional type uh, and are high grade intermediary type. The, the secondary tumors have the same histology than the, the conventional, right? And then you have this list of non-conventional osteosars. That they are the telangiectatic small cells, low grade, and the surface osteosars. So this is from radiographic. And you can see a, a surface of the sun. This is a para of the sun. So you see the mass, and uh, the mass is attached to the core. Okay. Usually it's in the metaphysis, uh, and they have a good, uh, usually good prognosis. This is again from this radiographic, and you can see the mass with osteoid matrix attaching to the posterior. Okay, para osteal osteosar. The differential diagnosis, as Colter said, is mass, yes, or heterotopic ossification. And if you see, uh, the, in heterotopic ossification, you have the process starts, the, the, the maturation process starts in the periphery, right? Uh, whereas in osteosar, in the center of the lesion. And then with this paraosteal inicial lucent line uh, that is separating the mass from uh, the bone. Periosteal, you will, you will never see this one. Okay, this is completely, completely uh, unusual. And you see a lesion in the cortex, okay? Um, you may see periosteal reaction, and is usually in the diaphysis. High grade surface, I call one of, of those. Uh, is like the paraosteal, but it's uh, surrounding the, the entire wall. Uh, and usually, uh, or you may have a little region that uh, may simulate a periosteal. Okay, let me see if I have my case there. Well, uh, then you have this telangiectatic uh, obtuse. And the differential diagnosis is with? TGC. Giant cell tumor. GTC. An erythrocytosis. Yeah, with fluid, uh, with fluid through the. Okay? Uh, but usually you have more aggressive uh, uh, pattern. You have aggressive periosteal reaction. All right? So, uh, giant cell tumor may be associated with ABC, right? ABC is uh, associated with other tumors in 50% of the cases. So sometimes you may have also uh, fluid uh, levels. Uh, metastasis, as I told you, renal cell carcinoma are usually fat cell, and you may see also some flow, uh, body flow because it's a hypervascular tumor. This uh, the small cell uh, type of orthosac is very similar to you. And I want to remember. I, I like to remember this one as a as a uh, you will like orthosac. Okay. So you have a periodic pattern. Uh, you may have a, a soft tissue mass. You may have periosteal reaction. Okay. So it's uh, you don't have uh, both of them. This is the one that I, you know, that, that's, this is my problem, the low grade center, because they may simulate a benign tumor, like for example, an NOF, okay, or prior fracture. So you see this lesion, I say, no, this is not aggressive, uh, probably it's nothing, and then you follow up and uh, you may have uh, an osteosarc uh, originated on this, on this lesion, okay? So this is, my fear. Uh, I, I am always worried about uh, missing this, this low-grade uh, central osteosar. Let's talk a little bit about uh, UWIT. Uh, UWIT is a 
tumor that is usually located in the diaphysis or in the, or in the, or in the metaphysis is a, a tumor of a young tumor. It's the fourth most common tumor. The most common one is primary, right? Multiple myeloma, and then octosar, and then chondrosar. But the, uh, it's uh, a very aggressive tumor, and it's uh, uh, common in the second decade or first decade. So Ewing sarcoma is a tumor uh, originated in the red bone marrow. So you have to follow the red bone marrow to follow the tumor. <laughs> so where is common red bone marrow? The epiphysis, metaphysis, or diaphysis? The diaphysis. More in the diaphysis. And in, in uh, adults, where do you have red bone marrow? In the flat bone. Okay. So that's why you see in all people you see you in sarcoma in flat bones, like in the pelvis. Alright? Yeah. So let me see. It has the youngest average age. Yeah. Remember, I asked you this before. If the patient is younger than five years old, it's probably uh, neuroblastoma. So this is another thing, very, very important thing. When you are giving a differential diagnosis, uh, osteomyelitis is very similar to you. Both may have a similar clinical presentation with a fever, pain, uh, leukocytosis, uh, increased sedimentation rate. Okay. Anyone can be affected, usually diaphysis and metaphysis. Uh, these pelvis and ribs are common in all patients. So this is the pattern of a lumen sarcoma. You see this moth in appearance, uh, in this case with pathologic fracture and aggressive periosteal reaction. This could be also <coughs> okay. In this case we can see uh, periosteal reaction and <coughs> whenever uh, you see um, uh, a permanent lesion in the bone associated with soft tissue mass and no cortical destruction, your differential diagnosis will be Ewing or lymphoma because they go outside outside the bone through the uh, aversion system. Okay? So you may see no cortical destruction, but you see a mass. I saw this many, many times and usually with uh, lymphoma. Okay? So, Ewing is not sclerotic. For the boards, if you see an sclerotic lesion, it's not uh, Ewing sarcoma. All right? So we saw this. Differential diagnosis, uh, lymphoma, metastasis, uh, small cell osteosar, uh, e.g. and osteomyelitis. So this is what I want you to remember about you. It's 80% in the first two decades. It has the youngest average, average age. And you will see a permanent lesion, usually in the diaphysis or metadiaphysis. Uh, you may have soft tissue mass with not cortical destruction or with cortical destruction, and you will see aggressive periodical reaction. And I want you to remember that the pain, this may simulate automatically. All right. So this femoral magic is very useful. It was uh, uh, Karen was the one that uh, started with this femoral magic. And I think it's very useful. You can, whenever you see a litigation, you can do this. You can go over the differential diagnosis uh, of any of these uh, tumors. So let's start with phagocytasia. In phagocytasia, there you cannot, the, there is no maturation of the, uh, there is no, uh, the osteolas cannot, uh, uh, you don't have maturation of the osteolas. So you don't have uh, <coughs> Right? Any bone can be affected. 
uh, and it's usually in a young people, but the monotonic form could be uh, seen in older people. What is more common? Monostotic or polystonic? Yeah, all the lesions are more common monostotic. Okay, monostotic are common. Very good. So the typical description is brown glass appearance. Although you may see a lithic lesion, right? Uh, this could be span side, and I want you to remember this. When you see a long lesion in a long bone, fibrous dysplasia is your first difference. Look at this span side uh, lesion here. So, what can you say in your differential diagnosis for this lesion? ABC, metastasis, renal cell carcinoma, thyroid, that's a good differential. Very good. So, in our situation, you have this. Uh, ground glass appearance, you have some expansion of the bone. Usually you don't have periodontal reaction unless you have a fracture. Um, monostotic is 80%, polystotic 20%. Usually when you have an impairment of the pelvis, the femur is also affected. Uh, when you have the polystotic form, it's usually uh, unilateral, but could be uh, bilateral, and, but a, usually asymmetric. Um, so you, you remember this, macunal, right, with the <coughs> abnormal skin pigmentation, endocrine dysfunction, and polystotic fibrous dysplasia. So let's go over the E and control. And control is a very, very common tube. Uh, you will see a uh, lucent lesion with polaroid matrix. It's uh, common in the hand, usually in the proximal phalanx, but you can see it in the metacarpal or uh, middle phalanx tube. And it's very, very common in the distal femur, proximal tibia, and uh, proximal femur. So what are you going to see? You're going to see a lucent lesion with polaroid matrix. One very important factor is that you don't have sclerotic margin. So you will see a geographic lesion with narrow zone of transition, type maybe 1B, but never uh, 1A. And this is very important. Uh, this is the typical pattern that we see when we are reading MRIs of the knee. We see those all the time. All the time. So, you will see the contrary matrix as a, a race and arcs. Okay? Maybe you have an arc here and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, rings. And you don't have sclerotic marsh. This is very important. And uh, <coughs> the absence of sclerotic marshes will differentiate an incontroma from what? That usually the radiologist put both in the differential diagnosis. Say, so, this may represent an incontroma or burning fat. Yeah. Usually, it's not uh, it's not tough to make the differentiation between both. Okay. Because of the sclerotic margin. On the MRI, you will see cold matrix. Cold matrix is similar to to free water. So you will see high point on T1 and high point on T2. So this is the same case, and you can see that the matrix of the tumor follows the signal intensity of the cancer. See, white, white, black, and black. And then you have all the, the dark, high intense fossa are the classifications of the color. Uh, usually, in order to call an chondroma, you want to see the, the arcs and rings. Okay? The only exception is in the hands. If you see a loose addition in the hands with, without control matrix, it's uh, enchondroma 
as it's proven uh, otherwise. Okay? Dr. Sanson, yes. the chondroid matrix would be the radiolucency and in the shape of arcs and rings. That's how I define it. The chondroid matrix is the presence of arcs and rings. Which are radiolucent. No, 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 no. no. Are they radio -pay? Are radio Yeah. You see this? Uh, let me see. You see here that there is like a ring? There. Uh, maybe you see an arc here. Okay? That's our, those are arcs and rings. See? The ring is the lucent. Uh, there is a lucent area in the center of the. Of yeah. the yeah. Okay. Okay, so understand that? <coughs> So uh, this is a, an impact. You will see a surfaces, uh, abnormal signal intensity, and what is the most specific sign of bone infarct? Double lung sign. Double sign. Correct. Can you explain, please? What is a double lung sign? Yeah, it's a fluid since the sequence is from your brain about increased signal from the low signal from the increased signal. It's kind of leading the surfaces. It's called a double brain. Double line. Right, or it's going to be serpentinous all the way around. So. Okay, so which one is you have, you have one that is hyper intense and one that is half intense, right? Mm -hmm. Which which one is uh, external and which one is internal? When you have the double line, and why? So I understand the question. You have two lines. Mm -hmm. One is hyper intense and hyper one is intense intense. line is the sclerosis. So that's got to be the the, uh, the the inside, and then the other line is edema and dying bone, and so that's external to the, mm -hmm. no? No, no. All the way around. Yeah. So, so it's, it's in, in, in the sclerosis is on the outside. Correct, correct. The, the outer line is the hyperintense line. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the sclerosis is the 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 outer line is the hyperintense because the bone is reacting with the sclerosis, and the inner line is the hyperintense that is due to edema and very good. So, um, in chondromas, uh, could be asymptomatic, you may have pathological fractures, and you may have malignant transformation. This is usually more common when you have enchondromatosis. That you, in enchondromatosis, you have multiple tumors, right? You have Olier and Mafuchi. Olier, you have multiple enchondromas, and the malignant transformation rate, I don't know if this is viable. I don't know if this is true or not. Mafuchi, you may have more risk of malignant transformation. The problem with this is that the enchondroma versus chondrosarcoma, uh, is the differentiation is very difficult for the pathologist. So many times they call chondrosar and they are not. So we don't know. Okay, I don't know what did we, what did you learn? The, That's what I was going to ask so you. Like other. <laughs> I was going to ask you if you follow them up ever, like a big enchondroma, and yeah, you know, yeah. like tell them to follow because, like, yeah. like Murphy said at ARP, he was yeah. saying that we should be able to differentiate more with MRI, and if as long as it's non-aggressive, you should say that it's enchondroma exactly for the reason you said, because then the pathologist, if he gets tissue, may say it's chondrosarc, yeah. even though he's saying with this you should really go with what the radiologist thinks, but it's very difficult, and he recommended like MRI. And as long as there was no cortical breakthrough, no right. thinning of the cortex. Right. But I didn't know if you would recommend it like. Yeah, I would recommend in a, in a big uh, chondroma, I would recommend for the yeah. Probably not in it. Uh, uh, yeah, not, uh, yeah, 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 he said no, yeah, no, yeah. yeah. And in context of, of chondromatosis, for sure, right? So this is a case that Dr. P gave me, and you can see all these panzer lesions here. And you see all the flavolith because this patient has uh, multiple angioma. And yeah, they, they amputated this patient probably because they thought that the patient may have malignant transformation. I don't know. So, it's quite, so would you recommend biopsy in those lesions? Like uh, uh, no. Because no. there's, there's some lesions if you biopsy that the pathologist, it will look malignant they to will them, but they're not my, like a chondroma myositis. And they'll treat it based on the pathology. Yeah, they have some horror stories at ARP. Yeah. Clinical follow-up is uh, the, the symptoms. In, when I took the board, the, the, the question was the, the most reliable uh, uh, finding for malignant transformation was clinical symptoms, like, you know, pain. 
You may also have a day differentiation. For example, you may see coordinate matrix and in the follow up, the coordinate matrix disappear and that means that there is a, a aggressive transformation. Um, very good. Um, and, uh, now, as you say, uh, you can read here, loss of classification pay. Uh, you may have some uh, industrial scaloping, but uh, you don't want to see much, okay? So if you see that the cortex is very thin, very thin, you may think that there is a malignant transformation of a low red control cell. Control is a disease of all people, usually uh, older than 40 years old. Uh, and it's very common in the pelvic bones. You can also see it in the, in the tubular bones. And this is a case of controsar. You can see here the control matrix. And if you see this tumor, is extending into the soft tissue. See here, it's expanding the bone and even going to the sacrum. And you see this tactical here control matrix, right? But this was a controsar. Control so this is what I want you to remember about a control. So it's a tumor that may present in any age, but it's very common between uh, 20 and 40 years old. It's very common in the two bones of the hands, intrafemoral shaft, and proximal humerus. And you will see a focal presentation with uh, no sclerotic margins and rings around. Okay, so take home just this slide. I think we, I, will, I will stop here and we will follow later. Okay, any questions?